So welcome everyone to the Freedom Virtual RV Rally. The word freedom is so appropriate for the times that we're living in with all the lockdowns, with the coronavirus restrictions. And I didn't know much about the RVing world till the past six months. And then I've been pulled into it and I've fallen in love with the RVers and the, the businesses associated, the membership organizations. It's really been a lot of fun for me. I'm concerned about my business that my staff has learned about this and they're talking about getting RVs and I don't want to lose my staff. <laughs> but anyway, I'm kidding, but several of them have started talking about, you know, RVs, possibly getting an RV now. So that's, that's cool. That's the impact they're having. Well, today is seminar number, the top seminar number 13. Our topic is strategies to protect yourself from fires. Our special guest speaker is Mac McCoy. We're so thrilled to have him on here. Uh, Robert Henderson's known him for a long time. Robert pulled him out of retirement and he's bringing him into refirement, you know, <laughs> you know he's refiring him. And uh, yeah, so Robert, will you go ahead and share a little bit about Mac since you know him well and- and uh, uh, be happy Mac to. Yeah, I know Mac for, I don't know, about, what, 25, 30 years probably, huh, Mac, since he... Yeah, at least 25. Yeah, and uh, appreciated Mac, and uh, he's always got uh, excellent seminars. Lots of people benefited from him. I know I benefited from him, and uh, he's helped probably save a lot of lives over the years, for sure, with the information that he's given everybody. I've mm -hmm. worked on a lot of Mac's... Max been a full timer too. I mean, you full time for a long time. You're on twenty the years. Yeah, that's full timer had, for twenty years. Yeah, so you've got a lot of experience from not just uh, your fire department, but also living the life. So you know what it's like out there on the road to be free. And if you don't like your neighbors, move. <laughs> <laughs> if the grass gets too long, go to the next spot. <laughs> So, yeah, you're going to enjoy Max's uh, presentation. He definitely, I'm looking forward to it because uh, he's got, he's forgotten more about fires than most people ever learn, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. Welcome. Good to have you back, Max. It's been a while. I missed your smiling face. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. Yes, and I'm going to share one thing while we have the recording going on, too, that Mac is the only male member of RVing Women. <laughs> RVing Women has been very supportive of this very first Freedom Virtual RV Rally. We appreciate each of the members in the organization. So, Mac, you're on. Let's have you uh, share about just the fire safety and bring in plenty of stories as you feel led when you're done sharing. Uh, then we'll go ahead and field questions or comments from the from the audience. Uh, when we're, when we're all done with that, uh, for those of you who are willing, I'm going to ask you to stay on and just share a brief uh, testimony of what this rally's been like for you. You know how it's benefited you or what the experience has been like. If you're willing to do that, okay, Mac, let's hear from you. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Mac, the fire guy. Uh, I never thought I'd ever be using that again because after my heart attack two years ago and uh, I've had four heart surgeries since I left the rally circuit, I've had intestinal surgery, both knees replaced and reconstructive surgery on my shoulder. So I figured I was done. I actually got rid of all my stuff and then along comes Robert. <laughs> he drags me back in kicking and screaming not really <laughs> when I found out when I found out that uh, I'd be mainly talking to uh, members of RVW I was so excited I, I've been waiting for this for days and I wanted to share one thing and those of you that were in Indiana when I retired, you all gave me this cup. And I will tell you, it's one of my favorite cups. So let's get on with the fire part of this. Uh, you know, when we buy an RV, whether it's a used one or a new one or whatever, and with all the publicity that goes on, 
living a life, they don't tell you everything. Um, these things that we're in are dangerous, can be dangerous because of the way they're put together. And the biggest thing is when you get your uh, walk around from the dealership or whatever, they show you this little fire extinguisher. Now it's interesting that the standard in FPA 1192 says that you will have a fire extinguisher, but it's interesting that the standard doesn't say, and you will know how to use it. They just put it in there, but nobody teaches you how to use it. Is it right? Is it wrong? Whatever. So let's start with the fire extinguisher. I want to cover fire extinguishers, their use, uh, CO detectors and smoke alarm. Well, they're not called detectors anymore. They're called alarms. But the most important thing is escaping. How do I get out of this thing if I'm trapped, whether it be an accident or whether it be a fire? So there are five classes of fire, A, B, C, D, K. Now, DK, we're not even going to talk about, but ABC, the ABCs of it is this. A class A fire is anything that leaves behind an ash. Now, I want you to look around your RV. If you're in your RV, what in your RV would leave an ash? About 85% of it would leave behind an ash. B is any liquid that when heated gives off an ignitable vapor. Let's see, what would we have? Oh yeah, gasoline, diesel fuel, hydraulic fluid, cooking oil, booze in the bay. Yeah. We don't have much B, but we have some. And C, every, if I ask a, a, a question on a fire extinguisher, what does the C mean? Oh, that's to be used on electrical fires. People, guess what? There is no such thing. Electrical fires do not exist. But what does electricity do? heats up class A and makes it burn. Now, in most RV fires, there's very little, very few fires start from 110. The majority of it is 12 volt. And as Robert can probably attest, they do not measure the amount of 12 volt wiring by the foot. It's by the pound. And in the, well, let's say class A diesel pushers, there's between six and 800 pounds of 12 volt wiring. So what's the chance of you having a 12 volt wiring fire? Yeah, I'd say pretty good. So class A, B, C. Now what's interesting, the standard requires that the manufacturer puts in only a B, C, I don't care if you're driving a 45 foot motorhome, a 48 foot fifth wheel, or a little class C or even a class B. Size of the fire extinguishers are all the same. In non-motorized, it'll be a 5BC. Now what does 5BC mean? What well, means it's five pounds? No, 5BC means five square feet. Now most RVs have a wastebasket that's five square feet. And in a motorized unit, whether it's a super ginormous class A bus or a little class B van, they're all the same. 10 BC, 10 square feet. Now the difference is that in a BC extinguisher, it's just baking soda. It's no big deal. 
the same stuff you can buy at the Walmart. It's just baking soda under pressure. In an ABC, that's where it becomes dangerous. It's mono ammonium phosphate. It says it right on the label. If you want to look that up, you'll find out that it's toxic and corrosive. Then an NFPA uh, booklet on fire extinguishers says that monoammonium phosphate will totally, completely trash all electronic equipment within 24 hours. That's just the dust. And the thing about these extinguishers that people don't understand is that when you spray that in your rig, where does it go? Yeah, pretty much wherever it wants to. Now, I don't know, Robert, have you ever had to clean one of these up? Uh, and, I've had a car fire, but not a motor home fire, thank God. And it's, well, what, what happens to a lot of dealerships is that kids thinks it's funny to break into them and set off the fire extinguisher. Now I have some close friends, uh, Wagers RV here in Salem. They have had to send new rigs back to the factory because all they did was set off a BC extinguisher, but it was too costly to clean it up. So they just sent it back to the factory. If it's used, they just go ahead and send it to the auction because it's too expensive. With an ABC, you have to actually have somebody like Service Master legally come and clean it up because it is so toxic. Well, how do we use a fire extinguisher? Well, I just happen to have one right here. And we call this, uh, this is a 10 BC, ABC. You see it has a gauge. And I'll ask in my class, I'll say, well, how do you know your fire extinguisher is good? How do you check your fire extinguisher? Well, I check the gauge. Well, is that all you do? Well, yeah, that's all I have to do. No. I used to have a fire extinguisher that said full and the whole back was gone. There wasn't anything in it, but it gauge said full. That gives you an idea that at least you've got nitrogen on board. But in order to truly check it at least once a month, you need to turn it upside down. And a lot of times, and I just felt it, you'll feel the powder fall or you may have to tap it to get the powder to fall. That's so it's loose. Then you would take it out to the hard packed sidewalk set it flat, tip it slightly, lift it and drop it about three inches. Now, what it should do is bounce. If it, not like a basketball, but it'll thunk, thunk. That'll tell you the powder's loose. If it just goes solid, well, you better work that a little bit. Because even if you pull the pin, aim at the base of the fire and squeeze, nothing happens, because it's packed like concrete. Now remember we talked about a little earlier what RVs are made of, fiberglass, screws, glue, brads, all kinds of pretty, pretty, pretty stuff. Well, when it catches on fire and you're inside, I can almost guarantee you that the powder won't work. When a fire is going, what is actually on fire? When you see the flames, what is actually on fire? It's just vapors. Solid, do not burn. Liquids do not burn. It's the vapors. Remember we talked about 12 volt, 110? Well, 12 volt, as you know, isn't gonna shock you, but it can get pretty hot. You'll burn your fingers on it. 
So if it's laying up against a wood structure, do you suppose it can cause it to char and catch fire? Of course it can. Now, what's interesting about RVs is that travel trailers and fifth wheels are not required to have their 12 volt wiring in conduit, in a plastic conduit. Motorhomes are, with the exception of under their dash. Get a class A gas pull or diesel push and just lift up the dash. And it looks like somebody took a colander of 12 volt wiring and just threw it in. And then you see the metal structures that hold the dash and give it its form and make it look all pretty and everything so that the dog can lay up on the dash. And because it's just put in there willy nilly, it can rub. I had a 40 foot uh, American tradition. I had uh, two fires and one <clears throat> just sorted out. And that was because it was in my dash and it was put in at the factory incorrectly. And so the thing is 12 volt can cause problems. And this dry powder stuff that you're given isn't gonna work. It just is not going to work. Well, what a lot of people would ask me at the end of class, well, Mac, well, what, causes RV fires. I mean, well, anything that can cause a house fire can cause an RV fire plus. For instance, you have little to no 12 volt wiring in your house. And so there are things that cause fires in a house and there are things that cause fires in an RV. The three most common causes in a diesel pusher, it's the diesel engine that causes most RV fires. Now, you say, wait a minute, diesel doesn't burn, really? Tell anybody that's had an engine fire that diesel doesn't burn. When we're done today, and you've still got your computer up and running, go to uh, YouTube, I want you to look up RV Graveyard, where RVs go to die in Kentucky. Now, there are many, 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 many uh, salvage yards, but this one is the largest in North America. It's on 33 acres, and they cater only to motorhomes. And as they take you on the virtual tour, you'll see that the majority of them are engine fires in the rear. What is the next thing? Oh, this is the most common in all RVs. That would be the Norcold refrigerator. Now, why did I say Norcold? Well, they've been in three major lawsuits that I'm aware of. It's not the residential ones. That's why they went to residential, is to get rid of the gas electric. But the design of the gas electric has not changed since 1986. And when you have gas and electric, now I'm not talking 110, I'm talking 12 volt, and you put them together in a box, chances are over time, you're going to have a fire. I've seen it literally hundreds of times. The next one, and it's for all RVs, 12 volt wiring, motorhomes especially, up under the dash. Now we're talking class A motorhomes up under the dash. Travel trailers, fifth wheels, brakes. Now I was just kind of cruising uh, some of the manufacturers here the other day. A lot of them now are going to disc brakes. Are they going to disc brakes because they're your friend? No, they're going to disc brakes because they've had too much trouble with drum brakes with magnets and they can drag. Robert, 
do you have a hundred percent break on all four or six spots on uh, drum brakes? No, I don't think you have a hundred percent. You actually have to have somebody like Robert actually check them to see if you have a hundred percent brake or have it adjusted. Disc brakes, eh, they're pretty foolproof. If drum brakes with magnets were so great, why don't you see tractor trailer rigs with them? Why is it a drum brake on hydraulics? I'm just saying, keep in mind every year, you need to have those checked by somebody that knows what they're doing. Because you can drag a brake, which heats up the drum, which will actually take the bearing grease and can set the bearing grease on fire and then it welds itself to the spindle. Then you start dragging that tire. The next thing you know, the tire's on fire. And how do you know it's on fire? Because somebody will drive up next to you. Their eyes are as big as saucers and they're pointing. Yeah, hi, yeah, we're just leaving the RV park. No, if somebody's doing that, they ain't that friendly to us RVers. Pull over, do a walk around, see what's going on. But when you do that, you better have a fire extinguisher in your hand because it's kind of nasty if you walk up a fire that's on fire. Then you have to run back to the truck and get an extinguisher. Because it takes 20 seconds for an RV to be completely involved in fire from the time it starts till the time you find it. Mm -hmm. 20 seconds is not very long at all. What kind of fire extinguishers are out there? Well, you got your powder ones. Then you got a whole bunch of new stuff. Go to your local fire department, ask them if they are called to your RV fire out on the highway, what are they going to use to put that fiberglass and all that stuff out? They use one thing, foam. That's all they use. Because why do you think these things are made out of fiberglass with rubber roofs? It's to repel water. But when you use foam, it actually can penetrate the fiberglass. So what you're wanting to do is this. Keep in mind, RVers, you're on your own. When seconds count, fire department's only 5, 10, 15 minutes away, depending on where you are. I've done this in the fire service for 35 years. You know how many RVs we've saved? None. None. You know how many RVs have been saved by the RVer because the RVer knows what to do? A bunch. But then they have to be rebuilt. And once you've gone through a fire, it's like, oh, I don't think I want to do this anymore. There are a number of foam fire extinguishers out there to be had. They're most generally all in a 16 ounce container but not all foams are the same. Now the fire department uses foam at 1%, 3%, and 6%. But remember, their hose is attached to that great big red truck with as much as 100 gallons of foam on it. Uh, you don't have that. So you have, you have to have a foam that will do what it needs to do in the shortest time possible. I'm going to recommend, I don't sell anything anymore, but I'm going to recommend two. One is Firefight Foam out of Orlando, Florida. <clears throat> it's because they do 10% foam. Why so much? Because they're putting this in the hand of a novice. Unless 
in your other life, you retired from firefighting, then you'll understand how foam works and how to use it. But for the most part, let me tell you something. You jump out of your truck or jump out of your RV and it's on fire. That's one of the scariest things that can happen to you in life. And you'll be lucky if you can remember what to do. That's why practicing a little bit will really help. And the other one is fire aid, spelled A-D-E, F-I-R-E-A-D-E. -E. The foam in both of these are pretty much the same and the same percentage. And you can go online, for instance, uh, Firefight is Firefight Foam LLC. And the other one is Fire Aid Foam. And they have pretty good websites that talk all about this stuff. Now, my suggestion is merely a suggestion. It's why we like being in America and the term freedom is what, how many fire extinguishers do we need? Well, in a class A motorhome, at least four. We need one at the front door. And believe me, these are not to fight fire. These are just to get you out. That's what you need to concentrate on. That's why you have insurance. Let the insurance take care of the motorhome or RV, you get out. But one at the front door, one in the kitchen, one in the tow vehicle, and one in the bedroom. Well, Mac, why do I need one in the bedroom? Gotta get out. Remember I told you we we're gonna talk about escaping? We'll talk about that again later. Fifth wheel, pretty much the same. A minimum of four. Now, if you're in a class C, and it's you and your partner, or maybe you by yourself, or you and an animal, you could probably get away with three. Now, if you're towing, you might want the fourth one, and that would be in your tow vehicle. In the fifth wheel, I talk about having four, one in the truck, one at the front door, one in the bedroom, and one in the kitchen cabinet. People say, well, why do I need one in the kitchen cabinet? My kitchen is right there at the front door. Think about this. Going down the road, somebody's waving, you stop, you got a wheel on fire. What's the first fire extinguisher you're gonna grab? The one in the truck. So if there's two of you, the second person will go around to the door of the, the trailer or the fifth wheel and grab that one that's at the door and come around and assist. Well, maybe you didn't need to use that one. So that one goes in the truck. What about the one at the front door? Well, that's the one you reach up and take out of the kitchen cabinet, put at the front door. Now you're ready to go again. That'll probably be a couple hours before you're ready to go again because you're shaking so bad. But the point is, the only reason you have fire extinguishers is to save your life. That's it. So knowing how to use them, and there's, I was on, uh, I was on the computer yesterday and uh, went through a lot of, because I was looking for fire safety stuff. Is there anybody doing it since I'm not? And there was a young couple on there that were doing it, but they left huge holes in what they talked about. They, for instance, talked about the dry powder extinguishers, but they didn't show how to check them. They didn't show how to use them. They talked about smoke and CO alarms, but they didn't talk about any, why you should have this one instead of this one, or what kind of smoke is here and there, and all kinds of stuff. What a lot of people don't realize is that in an RV fire, you have three times as much cyanide gas in an RV fire as you do a house fire. Why is that? It's what they're made out of. Where does cyanide gas come from? Plastics. How much plastic is in your RV? A lot. The glue. 
a lot of arson investigators, if they try to investigate an RV fire, they get confused by what looks like a pour pattern and don't realize it until they actually go to the factory and look at it. That's the glue pattern. Now, when that glue is put down, it's flammable, highly flammable, while it's liquid. But when it dries, it's no longer flammable. What happens when it gets hot? It's flammable again because it goes back to liquid. And so we're in these things and we don't think about exactly what's going on and we're not paying attention to what's going on when it comes to a fire. Fire extinguishers, everybody needs them. You need the right one and you need to know what it is capable of doing and not doing. To put out a liquid fire, you first have to seal over the liquid or cool it down. Dry powder doesn't do that. If you got a wood fire, you got to be able to penetrate the wood to cool it down. Dry powder doesn't do that. Water will for the wood, but it doesn't do anything for the flammable or combustible liquid. That's where the foam comes in. Smoke alarms. They used to be called smoke detectors. And now, of course, they're, you know, they're called smoke alarms. What kind should I have? Hmm. Manufacturer puts in an ionization. You know why? They're cheap. They're the cheapest thing. They meet the standard because you they say you can only have one. And the standard says you cannot put it in the bedroom. Now, as we mature, where do you suppose we should have one? Probably in the bedroom so we can get moving. Because I know at 75, I don't move quite as fast as I used to with my knee surgery. Ionization picks up small particulates. Ionization extinguisher or uh, smoke alarms are great in a fast splash fire. Where would you have a fast splash fire? Oh yeah, skillet on stove. If your refrigerator catches on fire, outside you'll see the flame. What's inside? Just smoke. That's all, just smoke. You have an engine fire in the rear in the diesel. There's a big roaring fire back there, but what's inside the coach? Smoke, just smoke. Ionization detector will not pick it up. It's not made to do that. So what you actually need is a photoelectric. Now, what's really nice is if you can get one of each, you know, it's a combination, ionization photoelectric. And if you can't, go with photoelectric. Now, I went to Lowe's yesterday. I was looking for something for a smoke alarm, some of the latest stuff out. And I found this first alert. It's a combo, smoke and CO. That's pretty cool. Now think about CO, it's not CO2, it's CO, carbon monoxide. Huh. In about 2008, when the RV industry was really hurting for money, they, the RV industry, went to uh, smoke alarm manufacturers and they went to the government and said, hey, we need to uh, have some help here. So it was decided, and I don't know who decided it, but it was decided that, well, the RVIA was a part of it, that we're going to put the CO detector, and CO is lighter than air, up on the ceiling, and propane, which is one and a half times heavier than air, which is down on the floor, we're going to put those two alarms together. And that way you're going to have a combo alarm. 
Now, wonder why they didn't think, let's put CO and smoke together, because when there's a fire, the smoke also has carbon monoxide in it. But no, they decided, the professionals, that we're going to take the smoke or the uh, CO alarm and LP alarm, put them together, and put them on the floor. Well, if you've got CO coming into your coach from your generator or the neighbor's generator, or maybe you had a big barbecue and you use a lot of briquettes and they went out and uh, so you just put them in a tub and slid them under your RV to keep them out of the weather. Carbon monoxide is, those things put out a lot of carbon monoxide. Right after the Vietnam War, we lost a lot of Vietnamese here in the U.S. because they were using hibachis, because uh, that's what they were used to using at home. And they kept killing a bunch of them because of the carbon monoxide from the hibachi. So carbon monoxide, when it comes in, you can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. So the thing is, you won't have to worry about the alarm because y'all already be dead or unconscious by the time the alarm goes off. Now, if you got a propane leak, it'll go off immediately, which is a good thing. Do you know what the propane alarm does when it goes off or why it's in 12 volt? Why you have to hook it into 12 volt? Because usually it's already or it's hooked to your battery system so that if you have low batteries, it'll go off to let you know. Now you'll be freaking out because you think it's propane, but it's just low battery. But a lot of our batteries now are sealed, but because they have an upgraded or updated, the regulation is the, it does the same thing. Where should I put my smoke alarm? Hmm. Depends on what kind of rig you have. Let's see. In the directions, it says that if you have a bedroom hallway over 30 feet long, one at either end. One at either end. Well, in an RV, especially a motorhome, if you're standing up front and you look to the rear, you don't have nothing but a bedroom hallway. Fifth wheel's the same, travel trailer, everything. So if you have a rig over 30 feet, one at both ends. Now, one thing that's kind of nice, I was reading about uh, this first alert. If you put two in, they'll talk to each other. Oh, by the way, They'll talk to you. They have a voice. Now, these go off at 85 decibels. Now, it's interesting, people with hearing aids that wear hearing aids in the daytime and take them out at night, sometimes 85 decibels is not enough to wake them up. Children, it's not enough. When you're breezing through your uh, computer and you go on YouTube look up smoke alarm test ionization photoelectric photoelectric is what you need in my opinion but look it up and it'll tell you it'll show you why there's a difference in why you should have one over the other but also there's one in there children and smoke alarms it takes a hundred and fifty decibels to wake up children and to wake up the deaf if you're partially deaf without your hearing aids or you're deaf without your hearing aids 150 50 decibels now it's interesting that the industry has known this since 2006 and have chosen not to do anything about it oh oh We'd have to change things. 
So 85 decibels is what you get. But the one about this one, you can program it to where it'll say fire in the living room, fire in the kitchen, fire in the bedroom. You can program it on here. Also, what's interesting is it is a CO alarm that when it goes off, it'll tell you evacuate, 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 fire or CO in the bedroom, 150 parts per million. It'll actually tell you how many parts per million. Take a look at your uh, LP detector combination LPCO. Now, when it goes off, you may not know whether it's propane setting it off or whether it is um, carbon monoxide or what, because there's no gauges on it that will tell you. Now, if you don't, if all you want to do is add a, a, a CO alarm to the bedroom, which is where it should be, get one that has a readout, an LED or LED, yeah, LED readout. Uh, they're put out, and the easiest and the least expensive, I paid almost 60 bucks for this yesterday, but I was looking on the internet, I can get two of these for around 60 bucks if I go to Amazon, and two's what you need if that's what you want to do. CO alarms, whew, don't go to an RV dealer and get one. They're very expensive. Get it online, Amazon. And you'll get the same thing, and a lot of it's free shipping. But the CO alarm is in the bedroom on the ceiling. Why is that? I don't know about any of the other guys, but boy, I sleep pretty soundly. And I've been told that I snore on occasion. I don't believe that because I've never heard me. And I've never woke me up. <laughs> but you need something that's going to be very close to where you can hear it. Remember I said we're going to put a fire extinguisher in the bedroom? Well, let's talk about that. Do you know that in all RVs it's required by standard in FPA 1192 that you have an escape hatch or an escape window? And that's the one right there in the bedroom on the wall. Now, when I've given these classes before, I've asked people, have you ever opened that? Oh, no. The dealer told us don't open that because it's only a one-time deal. And if you open it, you're going to ruin your warranty. Please. I can't roll my eyes anymore, so it's one of these deals. It's because they don't understand it. They don't know anything about it. If you've never opened it, maybe you can get it open. I believe it was in 2011 in Lake Havasu, we lost three people in a 2006 uh, American Eagle because the front end caught fire and they could not get out because the window was stuck. And I happened to talk to the pastor that came by and tried to help them get it open. He said, Mac, I now know what looking in the eyes of terror is. The man trying to get the window open couldn't get it open and realized he was trapped. Him and two ladies and a dog. Open them at least once a year. And you can take a little bit of uh, uh, silicone or whatever and just treat the rubber gasket that goes around the window. Now, most windows are hinged at the top. Some are breakaway hinges where you open them too far and that aluminum will break and the window will fall. You wanna make sure which yours is. For instance, most new rigs now are frameless windows because they look so fancy. Okay, if you buy that, fine. Most of them are hinged at the top and will not break away. 
check with your manufacturer. Are they breakaway or hinged? Now, you got to keep the window open and off of you because if you don't, it, when you're part way out, it will come down and hook you and then you're stuck, you're trapped. How do I keep it open? What am I going to do? Oh, I'll have my partner hold it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Get yourself a 24 inch long piece of half inch in diameter PVC pipe. Very light and you can hold your window open. Now, if you have framed windows, you put it in the corner to corner. Okay, corner to corner. It'll hold it open, gives you plenty of room. Now these windows are only required by law to be 17 inches high by 24 inches wide. Now I weigh in at 256 pounds. I just got weighed yesterday when I went into the doctor. Believe you me, if my rig was on fire, my fat body would go right through that window and I'd leave 100 pounds of ugly fat hanging on the window and I don't care, I'm out. If you have frameless windows, there's nothing to stick the pipe to on the glass. I'm sure that one time in your life, you've had to put in your home or somewhere, closet rods, correct, closet rod. So you go to the hardware store and you buy the little gizmo that's round, and the other is round with a piece cut out of it, and you put it on the walls and set your rod on it. Take the round piece, put some adhesive, Velcro, whatever, double face tape, and put it in the lower corner of the window. Either side doesn't make any difference. So that the stick has something to go into that will go on the frame and hold it open. Now these windows are much lighter than the ones that have uh, the frames on them, but now some of your windows just slide open. That can also be escape. But look around. Remember I told you about the three people that perished in the fire? They were going down the road, and you guys that have the big motorhomes, let me ask you a question, you folks that have big motorhomes. Let me ask you a question. Where do you fuel? Oh, it's a filling station, Mac. That's not what I'm talking about. Where is your fuel door? A lot of them still put them on the trailing edge of the front wheel well, because that's what they've always done. Reach up in that fender well and see if you can feel the hose. When one of those 22 fives blow, and it's usually the right front, which is called the trash tire because that's the one that you go off in the, in the uh, edge of the road with and then you tear it up on the inside coming back up on the highway, whatever. They have a tendency to explode. And when they do, not only do they take the fiberglass off, but they take that rubber hose, which goes into your tank. Now this usually only happens, I mean the blowout can happen anytime. But the fire usually only happens just after you have fueled because if you're the one doing the fueling and nowadays with fuel so cheap you're trying to get as much in there as you can and so you've got fuel trapped in that hose line well that's exactly what happened to these people at lake havasu now that's between lake havasu and vegas and if you leave Lake Havasu, if you're out there, you get out of town three or four miles. And if you look off on the right-hand side, you'll see a monument. And uh, that monument was put there for those three people. I spent two days in Lake Havasu doing classes, and we did a little over 400 people uh, just because of that one incident. So you may be cut off from your egress door. 
So you only have a choice and that's the bedroom window. Now, if you look at the ledge, that's a metal ledge. And you're gonna go out, but first, this young couple I told you about earlier, all they said was open the window and jump out. I don't know about that. And I used to ask in my class, how would you go out? Head first or foot first? The guys would all say, well, I'm going out head first. Only the women that I taught knew to go out foot first, belly down. But if you run your hand across the edge of that, you're gonna find out that no matter whether you go head first or foot first, you're gonna leave body parts behind. So you don't use a pillow, they don't work. You don't use a sheet, it's too thin. You use a comforter or a bedspread. Now you're not gonna have time to get fully dressed and then go out. So you're gonna go out with whatever you're sleeping in. So if you've got the bedspread, and usually these beds are queen size, now king size, that bedspread gives you enough for both of you to cover up in. Think about that. But you put that over that and that saves your body from being torn apart, literally scraped up, getting out of there. Now remember, you only have 20 seconds. So if you've got doors between you and the bedroom or the living room or whatever, close those doors at night. Well, we've never done that. Why do we have to do that? You don't have to do anything. But it will help keep the fire and the smoke off of you. Now, there are two of you. You have to decide what it is you're going to do. Somebody's going to fight the fire. Somebody's going to uh, open the window, put the stick in, put the blanket out, and go out. You need to decide because trying to figure it out at the time, uh, not a good idea. Not a good idea at all. So what you want to do is you want to practice it once a year. Now, ladies, if you're at a rally, this is a good time for uh, ladies to get together that have class Bs. Of course, class B, you've got what? One, two, three, four doors you can get out of. A class C, they're a little closer to the ground, but they still have an escape hatch. Class A diesels or gasters, they're the same. Fifth wheels, travel trailers, get together as a group. And I know you ladies love to do that because that's how we used to do it. And you need to practice it once a year. And the reason I say that, and I've learned this the hard way, your health changes every year, sometimes two or three times a year. And what you could do last year, you can't do this year. So you've got to figure it out. And on occasion, if we don't get out and exercise and do what we're supposed to do, you might pick up a little bit of weight. And so that changes what you can do and how hard or how easy. Remember, that's not 20 seconds each. That's 20 seconds total. These things are nothing at all to mess with. We've covered fire extinguishers, CO and smoke, and escape. Now those of you that have taken my classes before, you know there's a lot more to it. But we have a little bit of limited time here. So, if you all have any questions at all, uh, I was kind of hesitant to do this, but I've decided to do it because I think this 
fire thing with RVers is so important. And I hope it's okay with the hosts. If you want to get a hold of me, my email is RV Fire Safety at yahoo.com. You can send me a question and I'll, I'll get it and I'll answer it. If you want me to call you and advise you on uh, fire extinguishers or whatever, put your uh, phone number in the uh, uh, request and I'll be happy to do that. One thing I didn't mention in fire extinguishers, if we know where fires start, wouldn't it be a wise thing for the manufacturer to offer you an automated fire system? Well, they won't. And the reason they won't is because they don't want you to think that their RV will catch fire. It does. You have to be careful. There's a lot, I don't want to say a lot, there's at least three or four automated systems out there, and I've tried them all. And the one I recommend, again, is a foam system. And if you go to Firefight Products LLC, on their website, they've got all kinds of, of uh, automated extinguishers. And people say, well, I want one of these fancy schmancy ones and it does this, that, and the other thing. Keep in mind when you're dealing with a gas such as FM200, you betcha it'll put the fire out. It usually doesn't stick around long enough to cool anything down. So if that engine is still pumping fuel or hydraulic fluid or whatever started it, and the engine is still very hot, over three sometimes 400 degrees and it restarts again what are you going to do you spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars on the system which put the fire out but the fire didn't stay out i call it holding the fire foam is the only product that i'm familiar with that'll hold the fire Again, ladies, I am so delighted that I got a chance to talk to you. I hope you learned some things. So if you have any questions for me, please feel free to jump in there. Thank you, Mac. Mac. Yeah, thank you, Mac. This has uh, been, been very good. I'm thinking about our house too, because we had our little fire in our oven, you know, where that bottom element uh, burned out or broke. And uh, my, wife, my wife got very excited very quickly. But the whole idea of practicing, <laughs> the whole idea of practicing is uh, significant. You know, instead of like, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> We've got this, where is our fire extinguisher? Um, yeah, and, getting and you probably have you probably have a powder extinguisher, and you'll be buying her a new stove if you use that power powder extinguisher in that oven. Well, fortunately, she act, she acted and she got it out really quickly without a fire extinguisher. Uh, but it was yeah. So this has hit home because this has happened in the past two months to me. Well, let's go ahead. If you have a question, raise your hand, and I'll and I'll call on you. You have a question for Mac. Go ahead, Bernie. Mac, your talk was very inspiring today. One of the best talks I've heard about RV fires in my 25 years of RVing. And Thank I you. think it, it, it's an honor to listen to you. It's, um, it was just the fact that you had us all, I think, hypnotized just listening to you. I don't think any of us missed a word today of what you said <laughs> and the importance of a fire because you hit one thing, get yourself out, 
don't worry about the RV because you have insurance. You don't have That's insurance right. on yourself. So the biggest, the biggest investment in anyone's RV are the people inside of it. So I, I thank you for that. That was excellent. Well, thank you. I appreciate your comments. I do. Yeah, and we're going to, uh, Mac, uh, I know you've uh, put time and effort into this. Uh, I want to honor you. We're going to give away a couple of those uh, fire, uh, fire um, smoke alarms that you recommend. So uh, we'll be doing the giveaway on the May uh, 31st. So the one that you recommend, I need you to give us that, and we'll go ahead and order a couple of them and ship them out to whoever winds up winning those. <coughs> Well, there it's really easy. They're just first alert, and they're the combination smoke co with a voice. Smoke and co with a voice. And these are the photoelectrics, and you can get a two pack of them. I saw it yesterday uh, when I went to their website. You can get a two pack. They're not very. I'm buying them at Lowe's was very expensive but uh, online they're not at all. Well, I mean, they're expensive, but they're not that much. So that'd be great. If you don't need that one, we'll buy it from you. If you don't need it, if you need it, you, you can keep it, but we'll be happy to buy it well, from see, you. Well, see, I, I wouldn't class. need it. I wouldn't need it, but now that I'm hanging out with you and the crowd again, <laughs> I don't know what you're going to get me into next. <laughs> we're going to we're going to keep doing this. If you enjoyed it, we would love to have you on some more of it. Oh, you gave me so much it. to think about. So much to think about. You know, I was thinking about travel trailers too, where the uh, you get a flat tire on a travel trailer, they're out of sight, out of mind. We had a customer. What comes to my mind? I just popped in my mind. We 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 fixed this guy's uh, um, motorhome up for him and. Uh, it was like, got it all dialed in, and uh, I remember he had a little S10 Chevy pickup he was towing, and we got it all dialed in, spent quite a bit of money on it. I think he probably spent at least $3,000. And about a month or two later, he calls up saying something, he wanted to know something about uh, some other kind of RV, I don't know what it was, if it was another motorhome or a fifth wheel or whatever it was, but I go, well, what's what happened to your coach and he said well we had a flat tire on our pickup and the pickup caught on fire and it caught yeah. the motorhome on fire and he said we barely got out of there in time uh, to get out of that coach and so that was the tow vehicle got a flat caught on fire probably pulled over with the tailwind it's burning caught the motorhome on fire and they barely got out this is Amazing. See, what people don't understand about RV fires, uh, and we learned this as firefighters going through school, the typical temperature inside a house that's on fire is between 16 and 1800 degrees. Now that's up towards the ceiling. In an RV, again, because of what they're made out of, it's closer to 2400 degrees. And then with three times the amount of cyanide, that's what really threw me for a loop was the amount of cyanide in these things. And, you know, that came from years of research and everything, what do glues do and blah, blah, blah. But you only have to take a couple of whiffs of cyanide and you're dead. I mean, you're not unconscious. You're dead. And that's why I say 20 seconds to get out of those things. And it just, I, I really enjoy being an RVer, and of course, I'd have my fire drills. My wife hated it, but I'd have my fire drills, and uh, and of course, my granddaughter, when she was riding with us at the time, she was into it. She she liked climbing out the window and all that kind of cool <laughs> stuff. But on um, on YouTube, it's been a video that I did years ago. Escaping an RV, I think it's still on YouTube, so people can take a look at it and see exactly what I meant by getting out the window. It's called Escaping the RV. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. Lawrence raised his hand. Lauren, I'll unmute you there. Go ahead, Lawrence. 
you know, one tool that I've always carried with me is a, a spring-loaded centerpiece. Yes. And sometimes that's very helpful in any situation. The only thing is you never want to keep that in your toolbox. You want to keep it in your pocket or very close. <laughs> because <laughs> the fact is, is that will actually break the tempered glass. And a lot of glass yes, it will. is tempered. Well, we used to do um, hammers. I, uh, we'd have a, a window breaking hammer uh, because I used all the spring loaded center punches that I had in my turnout coach when I was on the fire service, they either grew wings or legs because you could never keep them around. And in an emergency, sometimes those little boogers are hard to find. But there are some good, and I've been seeing them on YouTube and stuff like that. There's some good um, hammers and tools with the spring loaded center punch, like you're talking about, that you can get. And I had uh, five of those three in the motorhome, two in the tow vehicle, only because you never know who's going to be conscious in a rollover and be able to have one. So you're right. Boy, those center punches, they are, they're worth their weight in gold. Mm. Mac, I heard the fire extinguishers, the powder ones work better for a weapon if you need to, if you ever needed to defend yourself, you spray that in somebody's face. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you say that because when I first started doing my classes, that's what I said. If somebody comes to your door and they threaten you and just shoot them in the face with a fire extinguisher, I said that for a couple of years until two RVers got sued by the people that they shot because the people just threatened with words. And so some judge found in favor of the perpetrator that that was, and I thought, well, okay, what are we supposed to do? Most of us are <laughs> unarmed. I thought at the time, and now that I'm finding out, uh, no, we're not. <laughs> no, we're not. But yes, it works great. I got shot in the face once quite by accident, and I'll tell you what, that hurt. That hurt a lot. But hey, if your life's in, in danger, do whatever you can do. <laughs> Thank you, Mac. Lawrence, you, you raised your hand. Do you have yes, thank you. Uh, Mac, on the automated systems, which are frequently put in the case of a diesel pusher back at the engine, what brand do you recommend? Well, um, I recommend, because I know it so well, I designed it and had it built back in the day and that's the one from Firefight Products. Uh, this is their little 16 ounce. But we also have, or they have, a clean agent that works in the refrigerator. But the one that I like the best, of course, and I had it in mine, was my uh, automated system. It's called the SS200. And the reason I like the foam is because it, shot 360 degrees with an eight foot pattern and your engine bay is not that big. But it covers everything and if there's liquid uh, running down the side of your engine or whatever, this is liquid, it runs with it. And what's nice about these foams is if you think about dishwashing liquid, what is the best dishwashing liquid that's in emulsifier? Um. Dawn dishwashing liquid, you bet. This is also an emulsifier, which breaks down the hydrocarbon, diesel fuel, gasoline, whatever, so that it cannot reignite. With the newer ones that are out, you know, they're pretty expensive and they blow off and they use FM200, which is okay stuff. And it'll put the fire out. Boy, their they're classes and so on puts it right out. But I asked them one time, I said, does it hold the fire? And they looked at me like I had said something not nice. Hold the fire means, well, can the fire come back? 
most of them, unless they're foam, the fire can come back. So I go with a foam, and it's clean. It's clean foam. Matter of fact, it's such a good degreaser. When the fire is all over, uh, just use a high pressure thing, and it's already degreased your engine and everything. Just clean it off. And we've got documented saves. We have several documented saves with our system. But do you think we could get the insurance companies interested? Nah, they'd rather pay. So, uh, and fire aid doesn't make any automated system. You got fire boy and fire bottle, but those are made for race cars. And so you'd have to modify it. Firefight products is made by an RVer for an RV. You don't have to do anything to it, just install it. And like I say, years ago, I designed it, but I didn't want to go into the to the manufacturing part of it. So I found a manufacturer and they still manufacture them as far as I know. So they're pretty good systems. And they're not I think we put some of those in before. Um, if anybody is interested, mm -hmm. some, I totally believe in safety and I know that uh, we would be happy to install something like that. But, uh, did they have uh, good systems for gas uh, coaches? Well, you know what's really interesting? If you remember back in the day, uh, gas with the old three-speed Chevrolet transmissions or the E4ODs yeah. uh, from Ford, those gassers and those transmissions were notorious for catching fire. But now with the new gas engines, both Chevrolet, because Dodge doesn't do it, but Chevrolet and Ford and the transmissions, there's very few engine transmission fires anymore on a gas puller, but yeah. do they have one that'll fit in there? Yeah, they do. Okay, cool. I just, another thing comes to my mind recently. This is really an interesting, I was looking doing a, one of our inspections at a rally that we do and I was underneath a new Ford. It was like a year or two old and I noticed that it had a fire on the right front. And interestingly, what had happened was one of the plastic lines for the, uh, HWH jacks or whatever brand they were it might have been uh, the, the other brand power gear whatever lippers and uh, one of those lines had gotten nicked from a welder or something and it was it the guy was driving down the road and he noticed smoke and he smelled smoke and he said thank goodness he wasn't on the freeway because he was on a side road not going very fast 25 miles an hour and he was able to jump out of that coach and immediately uh, spray and get that fire out. But if they'd have been going down the freeway or couldn't pull over where they were, they could have lost that whole coach. Is it? Oh, yeah. Not pretty fast. Well, one of the things that I recommended, especially in gas pullers and your transmissions, go to a synthetic transmission fluid. Yeah. And the reason is, uh, from a fire standpoint, it takes that transmission fluid to get up almost 400 degrees before it will ignite. Now, where a lot of transmission pro uh, comes from is, the, as you know, with that torque converter, if you're really pushing it hard, it'll whip that stuff into a froth and out the overflow it'll come, gets on your exhaust system and boy, it takes no time at all and they're gone. But with synthetic transmission fluid, it's not the same. They don't froth up as much. I described it as, yeah, your tra transmission fluid's being made into meringue. And when it overpressurizes, that's when you're in trouble. Right. Thank you. Um, Jan Miller says that Linda Brown of Arving Women has a great story to tell about how she used Max training. So Linda, you wanna share that? Oh, this is this is kind of silly, but um, I I can't remember the Mac the, the first time that I heard you speak. Um, and I, I'm I Charleston is the first time that I really can remember, but I'm sure that it was before then, and that was 2008. But anyway, um, I've taken Max classes many many times over the years, and he used to come every year to RBW convention. Um, 
so I'm I'm sitting in in and out uh, down here in Poway, which is outside of San Diego, and uh, <laughs> we're looking out. There's this really cool old uh, Mustang, and the guy's showing people his you know he's got the hood up and he's showing his all this work he's done. And I'm watching, and, and Barb's looking at it, and all of a sudden we start seeing smoke. And Barb's looking at me, and she says, well, are you going to sit there, or are you going to get up? <laughs> so I ran down to the car, and I thought, oh, God, I hope it's still in the back. And I grabbed just that small can of foam and ran back, and I walked up to the, to the guy, and I said, can I put your fire out? And he looked at me like dumb. And I said, I said, I'm going to give it a shot. And somebody call the fire department if this doesn't work. So I, you know, I keep saying all in my mind the whole time, what would Mac do? What would Mac do? I got, and it was obviously an electrical fire, but I got it out, but I wasn't sure if it was going to stay out. And my can was empty. And the fire department came. And I showed them what I had used and he looked very surprised. And so it did keep the fire out. But what was so funny is somebody pulled in next to us while I'm putting the fire out. And it's like, he can see flames coming out from under the hood. And it's like, I think you ought to move. Um, but nobody from inside the store who had fire extinguishers came out and offered to help the employees, uh, but it was interesting, but it's the only time that I've had to really use one of Mac's uh, foam. Um, the only thing that I've done, Mac, uh, you know, since I last saw you was uh, after my partner died, I did rearrange where the cans were in the coach since it's just me to grab the cans. And I have two big uh, extinguishers out in a bay right at the door. And I always make sure that I unlock that bay uh, when I park so that I can get to those uh, easily if I can or someone can help me. And I know that some of uh, my freewheeler friends, they do the same thing, that they uh, unlock that bay door when they get parked. Um, I do have a second can now in the tow car just because I'm by myself. Um, but I always pay attention and it's always in my mind what would Mac do? And it'll probably be there forever. So I thank you so much, Mac. And it's so good to see you again. And you, I remember you. <laughs> I would imagine that you still enjoy being out on the road. Yep, I, I do. miss being I miss being on the road. I, I can't even begin to tell you how much I hate being of course here in Oregon in Marion County we're under house arrest because of the COVID. And so it's just oh man, I miss the road like you can't believe. And I miss all you girls too. I loved it. Yep. Well we're gonna work at getting you back out there. Well, we miss miss you too, Mac. This is yeah. Meg. We miss you a great deal. So much, so much. Colleen, how do you like your background? How did you do that? How did we do the background? Yeah. Um, Yvonne, one of our RBW, the editor of our magazine, she uh, developed it, sent it to me, and then also sent me the instructions on how to load it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is beautiful. Yeah. See, I hate seeing stuff like that because I'm stuck here in Salem. Well, I like your trees and your little mountains there. They look good. Yeah. My wife's father carved those years oh. ago. Very nice. Colleen says to say hi to you. Hi, Colleen. <laughs> hey, Mac. Huh? I was wondering um, where it seems like a blown tire could uh, cause a fire, if, if there's a certain tire pressure monitoring system you recommend. I tell you, they're all pretty much the same. 
I want one that, that measures not only tire pressure, but yeah. tire heat, because that's the one that, uh, that the heat is the killer of any RV. Do you guys have any, Robert, down at your yeah. shop? Yeah, for years we used the Pressure Pro, but they didn't measure temperature. We've been using another one. I think it's um, oh, TPMS, something. I forget, I forget what the name of it is, but we're looking at, at some different ones. But yeah, the temperature is important. And I tell people, get yourself a little heat gun that you can walk around. You can get them for under 50 bucks. And when you're pulled over after you've been on the road, you can measure all your wheel temps. And if you got one that's running hotter than, than the other of them, you probably got something going on. You may have a brake caliper sticking or a bearing that's going bad. And that's another problem with uh, towing something behind you, a tow car, whatever. It's out of sight, out of mind. You don't hear it. You don't see it. I Speaking of that, I had a guy with a brand, a newer, not a brand, it was an older coach, but he had a bearing that was so bad, we spun it uh, by hand and just felt the roughness in it. He, he was in for replacing the airbags on the older diesel pusher. That bearing was so rough. If he had kept driving it, I think it would have seized up, potentially caught a fire or, or at least ruined the axle and everything. But our uh, one of our technicians, Eric Bex, had been with us for about 27 years. He, he turned it and he felt the roughness in it. And it. That bearing was wasted. But we see that, we see oil seal leaking. You know, those are the things that get hot. If you smell something, funny you know uh, be paying attention to smells as well because they could be a telltale sign we were doing a uh, a uh, magazine article at our shop one time mac and we had some guys from uh, um oh god i think it was jeff johnston was with us and we were doing a magazine article on the freightliner bell crank and the motion control units and he we were driving down the road they were going down the road in it and somebody said i think i smell smoke and it, sure enough, there was a fire on a diesel pusher. And what it was, it was on a Winnebago product. It had a wire that was between metal and wood, yeah, a heavy 12 volt wire. It was carrying a lot of current and it rubbed through the insulation on that and shorted out. And uh, one of our service writers, the guy had a fire extinguisher, jumped out there and we did manage to get it out, but it could have took that whole motorhome down in a hurry. Oh. Toe bolt is nasty. And speaking of your little uh, gun that you were talking about, I got mine at Harbor Freight. And I'd never used one before. I know mechanic, as you well know. So I'm going around checking all my tires, like you said. And I found that tires on one side were much hotter than ones on the other side. And boy, I'm fretting about that. And it's like, hey, dummy, that's the sun side. Uh -huh. So always make sure you know which is the shade side, which is the sun side. Yeah. But, um, oh yeah, you get to check the temperature of your bearings. And those are pretty, those are pretty good too. I mean, they're pretty accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Keep pretty accurate. distance away. Yeah. You know, so you can touch, put your hand in there and feel things at the back of your hand, but you got to be careful. Oh. A rotor, boy, it can burn you quick. Yeah. But just if you, if you don't have a heat gun, just putting your hand on the wheel somewhere in a safe spot on the drum, uh, on the outside, you can you'll feel a difference in it, and uh, that's one of the things that I look for as well. Well, to get you a, your tire monitoring system, like I said, and and I think Robert agrees, tire pressure is one thing, heat, heat. That's the killer of everything. Whether it's your engine and components, your tire, it's the heat. Now they're meant to take so much heat, but when they overheat for a long period of time, yeah, that'll take you down. So get a tire monitoring system that does heat and tire pressure, or tire pressure, and find out are they reputable? Because remember when we've done rallies, a guy will show up with this great yeah. whammy dammy thing and you go back the next year and he's not there. Yeah. So see a lot of that. It's yeah. always good. Like yeah, like get one from Robert. They he'll send it to you, right? Yep. You'll ship it out. 
Yeah. Yeah. I found good luck with tire minders. Tire minders. Company. They they'll replace your batteries for the life of the unit that you have. And once you buy their unit, you can upgrade at cost. And they have been at every show I've been to in the last 10, 10 years. That's a good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the one we're using. I can't remember what it is, but I'll check on that. Thank you, Bernie. I appreciate that. Bernie was in the fire business too for a few years, weren't you, Bernie? Yes, Mac. I was 37 years. I started as a firefighter, inspector, investigator. And then I had the loneliest job in the fire department. What's that? Fire chief. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I tell you what, we could get together and we could swap some stories. We could. <laughs> That's why I said this was the most interesting talk I've heard in my 37 years that I worked in the fire service about RVs. You hit it so you hit it right on. That's why I wanted Mac to be on our on our at our rally. Mac. Yes, I'm glad. Well, they told I started as a volunteer and somebody come to come in one day and said, hey, you know, they'll pay you to do this. I said, ain't nobody going to pay me to have this much fun. <laughs> 35 years later, but I loved it because I retired from the Oregon State Fire Marshal's office as the fire training coordinator. Okay. There wasn't a day I didn't like going to work. That's of course, they say, hey, if you like doing what you're doing, you never work a day in your life. That's it's right. Sure. Mac, it's so good to see you having a great time here and to see some of your longtime friends get to see you again, uh, be, be with you. I'm going to hear, just hear from, we're going to wrap this up uh, shortly. I'm going to just hear Yvonne. Have you, have you, you've met him before, you've known him for a while, right? Oh yes, I've met Mac many times and have taken many pictures of him with his firefighting, ex, you know, when he's burning stuff and people are putting it out and it's the best <laughs> pictures in the magazine. So, and I bought his, of course, I have bought his stuff based on his recommendations. I have, you know, one in my truck. I have him in my trailer. Um, yes, he's a, the genuine product and he's, oh, he's our favorite he is our favorite presenter usually at all of our conventions. And so it's great. Well, I, miss, I miss you guys like you just can't believe. And when they said the RV and women was part of this, well, man, I'm jumping all over this table. Just being <laughs> glad that I'll be able to see some of my friends. Well, it was and good I see consider them friends. Ditto. Well, that's touching. You know, webinars are the number one online teaching, marketing, and connecting to a bar none. And we're just seeing the connecting part of that, you know, right here. So it's really special. I have a question for you, two, two questions for you, Mac. One is, um, how long do a foam fire extinguishers last? Do they last forever or? Well, what's interesting about foam, if you look at some of the manufacturers, they'll have an expiration date. When my manufacturer, Firefight Foam, uh, put an expiration date on ours, I hit the ceiling because the foam lasts for 25 years. Dry powder extinguishers, seven, and that's their limit. Now, nothing goes wrong with the material inside, I mean, but that's so that you'll buy something new. Ours is 25 years. Well, thank you. And the other question I have is, yeah, do you recommend the same for your house? It seems like, you know, you would use the same, you'd have the similar recommendations for the house. In terms Absolutely of the same. Absolutely the same. Well, I can see and we are going to be doing an the, inspection of what we have. <laughs> even the smoke alarms. Uh, oh, and one thing I forgot to tell you about these smoke alarms is that if you buy two of them, they will talk to each other. Now they're wireless, but if one goes off, say in the living room, it'll also go off in the bedroom and vice versa. And it has a voice on there to tell you which one it's, is going off. And that's some new technology since I started selling these things years ago. These are pretty cool. Mac, I just have a quick question on those. Are those the battery ones or the hardwired ones? 
battery. Okay, thank you. It's too hard to hard, well, you can't hardwire actually in a motorhome, but these are the batteries. Now, some of them uh, have the 10 year battery and you can't get into them and everything. Well, that's okay, but I still like to have mine where I can change the batteries out if I want to, because you never know. And uh, yeah, you just check them every month. They have a test button and a silence button. And it talks to you. It's, that's the craziest thing. It'll actually talk to you. And we found out with children, some of them, the mother can record her voice on there because the kids won't stir unless they hear the mother's voice. They hear the mother's voice, they're moving. Uh -huh. But these, are, these first alerts are pretty cool. Cool. Does anyone else have a question? Go ahead, Susan. I just had a quick question on buying these uh, firefighter foam um, extinct the cans of extinguisher. Is there a similar situation um, in terms of buying them on Amazon as opposed to an RV place? Is there a best place or way place to purchase them? Um, for me, and I'm biased. I would go directly to the manufacturer because sometimes you can get them a little cheaper. Okay. Now, the other thing is since we're talking here, uh, if you go to Firefight Products to get their foam, you want to ask for ADA, A-D-A. Okay. Tell her A-D-A is her name. Okay. Got it. I was talking to Matt. You know him. Uh, all right. I don't believe a whole lot of what he says. Because uh, we, we've been doing this together for a long time. And her phone number, if you're interested. Thank you. Yes. 407. Uh huh. 687. 687. 2023. 687. 2023. And they are in Orlando. And uh, she'll take good care of you. Answer okay. any of your so questions. Can, and I can purchase them through her. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, we are going to wrap this up here now. I want to thank you for participating in this.